first works. I want you to notice that. Hallelujah. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's just pray tonight. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful to gather together, Lord, with your people. Lord, we are the sheep of your pasture. Lord, we are your children. Yes, Lord. And we are here tonight to do the exact thing that we just read in this last verse, to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. And Lord, we just ask that your hand would be upon us, that you would give us the right words to speak tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 And amen. Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was one of the, um, we would say, the premier or, or one of the more um, important, if I could say it that way, maybe that's not the right word, um, but certainly one of the churches that we find written about and talked about very frequently in the New Testament. The church in Ephesus was the first church that Jesus spoke to out of the seven. Now, Jesus is our great high priest. Just like in the Old Testament, um, the high priest would walk into the tabernacle and there would be the lampstand and there would be a fire that would be burning on it. And there would be seven, uh, it would be a menorah with seven lamps on it. And the job of the high priest was to make sure that that lamp was burning brightly, uh, that the fire stayed burning. And also understand that the fire that was being used was not just any fire. It was the fire that God had kindled when fire fell from heaven and it devoured the sacrifice. And they took that fire and they used it for all of the service that God did or, or that the people did on behalf of God. And this is an important point because you couldn't just rub a couple sticks together. You couldn't just get fire some other way. It couldn't be common fire. Okay, it had to be the fire that God sent down. And this is a powerful picture because all of those things that happened in the Old Testament were pointing ultimately to what is happening in the New Testament or under the New Covenant. Jesus, our great high priest, is walking in the midst of the lampstands and he's looking at the fire of each one of them. And just as he would in the, uh, the high priest would have in the Old Testament, he's, as it were, adjusting the wick. He's pouring in more oil to make sure that the fire burns brightly. And in this particular passage, we see clearly that the lampstand represents a church. Okay? Yes. So we have seven lampstands, we have seven churches. So it is of the utmost importance Hallelujah. that the church be burning brightly, okay, with the fire of God, if you will, which is representative of the Holy Spirit, to be burning, okay, to be a light in their community, to be a light in the territory that God has placed you. See, God has placed this church right here in this specific spot to be a light to this area, if you will, for all of the people who come in. But when he places a church in a specific spot, he is going to be watching the fire. He's going to be pouring in his oil to make sure that it continues to burn brightly. But I want you to notice something that happened to this church at Ephesus. Over time, it reached the point to where they left or they forsook, we could say, their first love, okay? They forsook the love that they had for God. They were doing a lot of things that were commendable. They were doing a lot of things that were good, in other words. He said, I know your labor, I know your patience, how you can't tolerate those who are evil. 
and you have tested the apostles and that are not, you have found them to be liars. So they were being very discerning. They were making sure that everything was going just right. But over time, they began apparently to give the love that belonged to God to other things. And there was no longer an emphasis um, on people truly, if I could say it this way, getting saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, and burning for God themselves. In other words, the fire started going out. The fire started going out. Now I want you to imagine just for a minute a lamp stand. Now this is a microphone stand, but if we had a lamp on the top of it that had a fire burning and we switched out all the lights, this lamp could light this room, right? Mm -hmm. But if this light began to grow dim, then darkness would begin to, to come into the room. And the more dim, the more the fire went out, the darker it would get. Hallelujah. How many of you know the world that we live in here in America, right here at Independence, in a way is a very dark place. Oh, yes. It is getting darker. Evil is on the prowl, if you will. Uh, sin is growing more rampant by the day. Things that are abominations in the Bible are being made normal, like it's everyday thing, you know, like it's no big deal. And in my mind, this is evidence of the fact that the churches are not burning as brightly as they should, okay? Yes, yes. They're not burning as brightly because... Really what darkness is, is when you take away the light, right? If you turn the light off, it becomes dark, okay? And the same thing is true when it comes to the churches. If you would have gone into the Old Testament, you would have seen the light stand. If you would have blew each one of those lights out, it would have became pitch black. And darkness is just a way of saying that sin and evil is beginning to dominate. And the light that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit from the Holy Spirit living in us as Christians is like a light pushing back, if you will, the darkness, okay? impacting our society, impacting the people that are around us. But if we as Christians begin to leave our first love and the fire begins to go out in our life, then we no longer have the impact that God wants us to have. And I want you to see the consequence of this. In this uh, passage, notice this. Jesus said in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Now, some of you have been serving the Lord probably a long time, maybe some of you not so long, but all of us can remember when we first got saved, oh, can't yes. we? When you were first born again, how on fire for God you were. And how you wanted to serve God. I often say that when I first got saved, me and a lot of friends of mine who got saved around the same time, we were a revival looking for a place to happen. Does that make sense? We were a revival looking for a place to happen. Why was that? It was because we were burning for God. We were burning for God. When we walked out of the church, it didn't end for us. Our mind didn't go someplace else and we just do other things. We were consumed with God. When we were driving down the street, we were consumed with God. When we were at home, we were consumed with God. When we were in the workplace, we were consumed with God. We were burning, burning, burning for the Lord. But what can happen to us over time is that that love, that zeal that we have for God, we can begin to give it to other things in our life, and we no longer burn for the Lord the way that we once did. Hallelujah. And the problem with that is when that begins to happen in a church, in many people in the church, then the whole church loses its effect in the community. And the lampstand itself begins to go dim. Notice what Jesus says. Remember from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But notice what he said will happen if you don't <coughs> repent. He said, or else I will come to you quickly and I will remove 
your lampstand from its place, except you repent. You say, why would he do that? Well, let me ask you a question. If we had a lampstand in this room, and it had a fire on it, and it was the only source of light in this room, okay, and it was right in the middle of the floor, let's say, and then suddenly, or even slowly, the fire started to go out. If you were walking around in the room, chances are you would trip over the very thing that's supposed to be light in the room. Oh, yes. Think of this. Hallelujah. When the light goes out in a church, when it's no longer a loving church, when it's no longer burning for Jesus, when no longer it's no longer treating uh, one, one another as we're no longer treating one another with the love of Christ. And the love of God is not there. And the power of the Holy Spirit is not there. Then we become a stumbling block even to the world. Does that word make sense? Yes. Uh, it, uh, something to trip over. Uh, people look and say, you know, they're supposed to be loving. They're supposed to be caring. They're supposed to be, you know, fill in the blank. But, but they're not that. Jesus said, rather than allow the church to be a trip hazard or a stumbling block, I will just remove it out of its place. If this room were completely dark, this stand would be something to trip over if we were trying to feel our way around, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. You would just trip right over it. And that's why it is vitally important that the fire continue to burn in the church, that it would continue to burn. Now, one thing I want to just talk about tonight, we'll just talk briefly about it. You can look these things up in your own time, but I want you to notice something. He tells them what to do. Remember, verse 5, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the first works. Repent and do the first works. Okay? Now, you say, well, what does that mean? Repent and do the first works. Well, <coughs> instinctively, if you're just reading this and you think, well, he's speaking to me, you'd think, well, I need to go back and repent of my <coughs> sins again. Or maybe I need to look at the things in my life that are affecting me as a Christian and, and get those things out of my life. But for the church at Ephesus, okay, we have an account of what that church did at first when it came into being. And it's in the book of Acts, chapter 18 and 19. If you want to just kind of turn over there. The church at Ephesus started out with some people who had probably heard the gospel from a man you've heard of him, I'm sure, by the name of Apollos. Apollos, when he first started preaching, only knew... John the Baptist message. That's it. He only knew John the Baptist message. So what he would do is he would apparently preach this message that John the Baptist preached, which basically told people that what you need to do is prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord. That's what John the Baptist did. You need to get your heart right with God. That's the most simple thing I could say about that. And he preached in such a way that the people would get their heart right with the Lord, they would turn away from their sin, and they would begin to follow in the direction of God. Okay? Which means that the first thing they had to do was agree with God. Okay? That's the first step, is to agree with God. That's something the world doesn't like to do today. Uh, they would rather say that sin is not sin. They would rather say that certain things are not sin, and there's nothing wrong with it. As a matter of fact, they like to force even Christians to not say certain things are sin. They're trying to make it illegal to even preach against certain sins, especially sins of a sexual nature. Hallelujah. But I want you to understand tonight that the first step that we have to take when we come to the Lord, no matter who we are, or if we're preaching, we need to know that that person who is not saved 
needs to turn to the Lord and come into agreement with God. Amen. We know this as repentance. Amen. Repentance comes from a Greek word that means to change your mind and change your direction. Come on. So if you're going this direction towards sin, you turn your back on sin because you changed your mind about sin, and now you agree with God and you're going forward with the Lord. Amen. It's kind of like when you're in military, you know, all about face. Forward march. I've heard that illustration, and I think it's true. And that's what repentance is. I used to tell my kids when they were little, we would be driving in the car, and I would try to explain to them what repentance means. And I would tell them if if I'm going to go to, let's say, a friend's house who lives out in Olathe, which is about you know 20 or 30 miles from here, and I'm driving down the highway, and I suddenly change my mind about where I'm going, I don't just keep going, do I? I take the first exit. Amen. Hallelujah. I pull off, I turn across, and I go back the opposite direction. Okay? And that's really what <coughs> repentance is. But understand that Ephesus began with people who were repenting in the same way that the people repented when John the Baptist preached. They would confess their sins, they would agree with God, and then they would ask, what do I need to do to show or to prove that I've truly repented? Some of the soldiers asked, what do we need to do? And of course, John the Baptist told them, he said, well, don't do violence to anyone. Some of the other people asked, what, would, what should we do? And they said, he said to them, he said, well, if you have two coats, give one to someone who needs it. Yeah. Okay? This demonstrates the fact that material possessions don't have control of us anymore. We're, we're forsaking these things. Amen. Jesus said you can't serve God and money or possessions. Hallelujah. So one of the proofs that we've truly changed is we don't have an attitude towards our possessions that we're real greedy and stingy. You know, we're not trying to accumulate more and more stuff even though we see people who have needs. So understand that. That's one of the things that John the Baptist said to do. So here's Apollos. He's preaching this message of John the Baptist. And the people are doing everything that he asks. They even get baptized in water. Okay? They get baptized in water. Because these people, when they heard the gospel, they wanted to do everything that God asked them to do. Amen. They were excited about God. Amen. How many of you felt that way when you were first a Christian? Hallelujah. You were excited. You couldn't wait to hear what God had for you to do. You were just excited about the Lord. Mm -hmm. I remember as a young Christian in particular, before I got involved in ministry, I, I just needed to do something with, with the Holy Spirit that was living inside me. So I would just try to find every revival meeting or church service that I could attend. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you know when you're burning for God and you want to do God's will, that's your attitude. Amen. And that was the attitude of these people at Ephesus. But there was a problem. The person who was teaching them or preaching to them only knew part of the gospel. That's where Paul comes in. Let's start in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Apollos, of course, eventually learned the rest of the gospel, and then he <coughs> moved on to Corinth where he could minister there. But notice this, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding some <coughs> disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Notice this question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. In other words, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. Who is that? Or they may have said, What is that? And then Paul asked them, He said, Well, into what then were you baptized? Hallelujah. And they said, Into John's baptism. And then Paul said, listen to this, 
John indeed baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they'd already been baptized by John's baptism, but because they are so willing or, or wanting to do God's will, they're going to now be baptized again. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes it's hard to get folks to get baptized the first time. <laughs> right? Amen. I mean, you know, they want to try to put it off. And we've held a lot of baptisms over the years, and sometimes people will sign up and then they don't come. And others who don't sign up end up coming. So it's interesting how that works. But I want you to notice the attitude that the people have. Okay? Because remember, Jesus said, go back and do what you did at first. Go back and do what you did at the beginning. <coughs> Notice what he says. What were you baptized? Into John's baptism. Then he explains it to them. He said, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The second time they were baptized. When Paul had laid his hands on them, watch this. The Holy Spirit then came on them. And they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. In other words, the Holy Spirit came into them in such a way, okay, that there was a prophetic element to their life at that point. Like in the Old Testament prophets. And obviously, this is something that early on Paul noticed. When he started talking to them, he noticed there's something missing. There's something not quite what it needs to be. So he begins asking them questions. And of course he discovers that they didn't quite have the full gospel uh, preached to them yet. But again, their attitude of heart was this. Whatever God wants me to do, I'm willing to do it. Amen. You know, you don't get to that point. Usually you don't get to that point overnight. Um, I know for me, it took me some time to get to that point. As a young Christian, I came to church on the church band or the church bus. I'm talking about when I was a child. And I typically just kind of thought, well, the way to be a Christian is you just do your best, ask God to forgive you of your sins, and just try your best. And I was more down than up. I was more out than in. I was often out of church. As a matter of fact, you could probably name on one hand the number of years that I spent in church my whole life up until I was in my early 20s. But God started dealing with me. And the thing that He had to do first was to get my attention. My undivided attention. That means that I have to focus completely on God. Amen. I had gotten hurt at work. I had broken this finger, I was an auto mechanic, and I had broken this finger terribly bad. This bone was crushed so bad it was like crushed ice. And how do you know the ice you get in your drink? It's crushed. That's how the bone was. They couldn't put a pin in it because it was just pieces. So they wrapped it up, and I couldn't, obviously, I couldn't work with wrenches or anything like that. So I took a job behind the cash register at the place where I worked, and after all the little jobs were done, there isn't much to do. Most people would bring a book. I bought, brought the Bible. And I began to read it. I had been to church. I had said the sinner's prayer. I had done a lot of the things people tell me to do. But I knew that I wasn't where I needed to be with the Lord. And I knew I had never received the Holy Spirit. And I began reading through the Bible. And one by one, God began to deal with me about stuff. He would deal with me and put his hand on this area of my life. And he would put his hand on this area of my life. And I had to make a choice at that point. Just like these saints at Ephesus had to make a choice. When God put his hand on it, what am I going to do? Am I going to obey God or not? And the Lord just gave me grace. And I obeyed the Lord until I realized that what he ultimately wanted me to do was just be an obedient child of God, that he could ask me anything, and I would be willing to do it. And that was the attitude of these people here. And I want you to notice something. 
Just like in, in this passage in Acts 19, so it was in my life. As soon as I stopped resisting the Holy Spirit, as soon as I started cooperating with the Holy Spirit and allowing God to do a work in my life, it wasn't hard to receive the Holy Spirit and to become filled with the Spirit. You see that? I often tell people, you can't resist the Holy Spirit and receive at the same time. Okay? You have to have an attitude of submission. And that's what the folks had in the, uh, at the church at Ephesus. When Paul told them you need to be baptized again, they didn't argue about it. They didn't give any excuses. They just simply did it. And notice how easy it was for them to receive the Holy Spirit. It just simply said they were baptized. Paul laid his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. That's how the church started. It started with 12 people who were willing to do whatever God asked them to do, no matter what it was. If it meant being baptized twice, we'll do it. If it meant surrendering this or that thing out of my life, they were willing to do it. They received the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, just like on the day of Pentecost came, and they began to burn for Him. And these twelve people became a lamp in Ephesus from which God could begin to do a work in this horribly, unbelievably pagan and evil city. He started with 12 people who were sold out to God, burning for God, willing to do whatever it took to do God's will. Amen. What a powerful thing to consider. We're not going to read through it. You can do this in your own time. But God started doing powerful miracles in Acts chapter 19 to the place to where He would use even a piece of cloth off of Paul's body to either drive demons out of someone or to heal them by the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, that's some awesome power being manifest Hallelujah. at Ephesus. Some Amen. awesome power. This isn't something that's being faked. This is the real deal, as we would call it. So there were some other people that decided, well, we're going to try the same thing. Okay, so they decided, the seven sons of Siva, we're going to go out, we're going to cast out some devils. And you know the story. They tried to cast out some devils. They said to this one that was possessed of devils, something like this, uh, we adjure you by the uh, Jesus that Paul preached. Come out, or whatever. And the person that was possessed of demons simply said this, Paul I know, in Jesus I know, but who are you? Hallelujah. Who are you? You see, the devil did not know who this person was because they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They believed that they could just say the same words that the person who was filled with the Holy Spirit could say and the same effect would happen. And the scripture said that the person jumped on them, of course, this person being full of the devil, demon-possessed, and beat them up and sent them away, bruised and naked. What a powerful thing to consider. Oh, man. But notice this, that when this happened, when this happened, that the power of God manifest in this way Amen. caused great fear to come upon the whole area, even upon the church even upon those who had already, perhaps, started serving the Lord. And they went into their homes. I want you to notice this. They went into their homes and got all of the evil artifacts that they had, all of the questionable things. Sometimes they would wear these amulets in those days that they believed would either bring them good luck or they had powers. And these things were demonic. And there were other little uh, things that were... Uh, like little idols, like so, made out of silver, perhaps. And um, they would have these in their homes, and these were false gods. They gathered all of this stuff up, and they found that it was worth 
50,000 pieces of silver. And they burned it. They burned it. Amen. They took the sin that was in their life and they burned it. Notice they didn't put it on Craigslist. <laughs> hmm? They didn't put it on offer up. They burned it. Which in the old days was a way of saying, I utterly hate this stuff. I want nothing to do with it. Repudiating is what we would say, the contents of it. We don't want anything to do with it. We're not going to give it to our fellow brother or sister. We're not going to sell it. We're just simply going to destroy it. And that's exactly what they did. This was evidence that they were repenting. They were continuing to repent. Okay? God put his hand on something in their life. You know what they said? Let's get rid of it. Put it in a pile. We're going to set fire to it. That was their attitude. And guess what? They kept on burning for God. They kept on burning and burning and burning until an awesome, awesome revival broke out in the place. Now the devil didn't take it sitting down. Because he was going to try to kill, not just them, but Paul as well. And there are many things that we could talk about along that line. And I'll let you kind of study that on your own time. Yeah. But I want you to know something. That by the time we get to the book of Revelation chapter 2, Paul the Apostle has spent three years helping this church. John the Revelator, the person who wrote the book of John and the book of Revelation. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He spent quite a bit of time also at this church. So it was, it was, a, it was a big time church, we would say. It was big time. They had, had Timothy there, uh, was one of the lead elders at one point. Okay, possibly even Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, was there at one point. As a matter of fact, John 3.16, how many of you know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That very verse could very well have been written from Ephesus. Paul the Apostle could very well have written 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, which has 1 Corinthians 13. The great love chapter. When you read the book of Ephesians, you'll find there's some 30 or more times that the word love is used. He talked about how he had heard of their love and faith and all of these different things. But between the time the church started and the time that Jesus speaks to them is a 40 year period of time, roughly. 40 years. A lot can happen in 40 years, can it? Hallelujah. Yes. A lot can happen in 40 years. And what happened in that 40 years is apparently generations would come up within that church who were no longer burning for God the way they did at first. And the solution to that was to go back and do the things that they did at first. That's the key thing. There's a passage in the, in the Old Testament said, that says something to this effect. It says, And there arose another generation who knew not the Lord, neither the works that were done in Israel. It's in the book of Judges. They are, there arose another generation that didn't know the Lord. You know, just because... A person is raised up in church doesn't mean that they have the same experience in God that their parents had. Hallelujah, that's right. It doesn't mean that. I have six children. I have 11 grandchildren. Um, my oldest daughter will soon be 30 years old. And from the time that I was raising my children up, I always wanted to pass down the faith that I had to them. Hallelujah. I wanted to see them be truly changed, yes, truly God. born again, Hallelujah. truly yes, on fire for Amen. God. I wanted to see that happen. But I knew that the only way it would ever happen is if they as individuals 
would respond yes. to the Holy Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. I couldn't preach enough to them to make it happen, although yes. I did teach them God's Word. Yes. I could pray for them. I could do all these things. But they as individuals Amen. had to make the response. They had to respond to God. Amen. Hallelujah. When God dealt with them in their heart, they had to respond to Him. Yes. And I always encourage them, and even to this day, that that is the key thing. To respond when God is healing. Yes, but apparently, over time, over this 40 year period of time, a lot can happen in 40 years. Mm -hmm. I haven't even been a Christian 40 years. Hallelujah. I've seen a lot of stuff happen in the 25, 26 years that I've been serving the Lord. And you know what He wants to do? He wants to get that fire a little bit down. Come on. Come on now. He wants you to take the love that belongs to Jesus alone Hallelujah. and give it to something else in your personal life. Hallelujah. The yes. devil wants yeah. you to give away the love that belongs to God. And the next thing you know, you're in a situation yes. like the church at Ephesus. You're going through the motions. Yes. You've got your doctrine right. You even hate sin. But you don't have the real thing because yeah. the fire... Yeah has gone out to the place Hallelujah. where Jesus said, Hallelujah. if you don't do it, I'm going to have to take your lampstand away. Yes. Because you'll just be something for the world to trip over in this world. Jesus. You know, I don't want to be a Christian that folks trip over. Can I say that? Does that Amen. make sense to you? I don't want to be a source of stumbling yes. for other people. I want to be a light. Amen. And I want this church to be a light. Amen. I want every church yes. to be a light. Yes. Hallelujah. And the key thing is to burn for God. Hallelujah. And to respond when God is speaking in the meeting. It could be something like our, our dear sister was, was singing a special. But in the very words that she's singing, the Holy Spirit can oh, yes. quicken something to somebody oh, yes. and suddenly God spoke into their heart and maybe they were starting to go down the wrong way, they turned back oh, yes. and they got back in the back. Oh, yes. Why? Because they're hearing what the Spirit is saying. In the worship service, when the brother is leading worship, maybe God will just single some phrase from that song out and he'll touch your heart yes. and he'll cause you to get back where you need to be. When the preaching of the word is going forward, God is speaking to the people. Yes. Maybe Hallelujah. someone gets up and gives a testimony and they begin to speak and suddenly you'll recognize that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you yes. at that moment yes. and you need to give heed to what the, the Spirit is Hallelujah. saying. Yes, yes, God. Yes. Hallelujah. Seven times in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, Jesus says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying Hallelujah. to the churches. Hallelujah. If every church in Kansas City, if every church in America would go down on their knees and get up Sunday morning Hallelujah. with this attitude, Hallelujah. you know what saints, this morning we're going to hear what the Spirit Hallelujah. is saying. to the churches yes. and that's going to be our operational mode from henceforth we're not going to do what we want to do we're not yes. going to say what we want to say we're not going to preach what we want to preach we're yes. not going to sing what we're going to sing Hallelujah. we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says you want to be effective be led of the Spirit. Yes. Burn for God right here in this part of independence. Hallelujah. When you begin to burn for God, you burn for God in the workplace. Yes. God will begin to move. Yes. This is a very challenging message tonight, even for me. Yes. God has brought me back to it over and over again, and He's brought me freshly to that place of repentance. I just want to pray tonight. Yes. I just want to pray. Yes. Maybe you're here tonight and the Lord is speaking to you. That you've taken the love that belongs to Christ and you've given it to something else in your life. Maybe you're not burning for Him like you once did. Maybe you are burning for God. I want to challenge you to just respond to the Holy Spirit.
Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Be submissive to Him. Let God deal with you as an individual. Let God deal with you as a church. Not just tonight, but every single day of your life. Every single time you gather together as saints. Lord, I just pray for the church tonight. I pray, Lord, for this church that you would just move and that the saints here would burn with the fire of the Holy Spirit. That you would continue to do a work in this church. That you would continue to make sure that this church continues on doing the very thing that you have called it to do. To be a light in this darkness. Pushing back the darkness. Pushing back the forces of evil, Lord. Not in their own strength. Not in their own programs. Not in their own plan. But by hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you want to maybe find a place to pray, we're just going to... Seek the Lord, and I'm turning it over again to. Hallelujah.